Hey church, would you help me to say hello to those who are here for the very first time today? We're glad you're here. There's a worship guide in the seat backs all around you if you'd like to grab one of those, a little bit of information about our church. There's a connection card if you'd like to connect with the church. I always say there's a place also to put down some prayer requests. We believe in a God who still answers prayers. Amen, everybody? And I listen, whenever I've got a challenge, I've got a prayer team that I'm calling and I'm, I'm alerting and I'm inviting them in. So take a moment to avail yourself of the connection card so that you can connect with the church. And uh, we always honor your information. I, I say it this way all the time since the beginning of the church. We give you a hassle-free guarantee. If you fill out the card, I am not showing up at your house unannounced. Amen, everybody, right? I'm not going to interrupt the Saints game later on. Come on, go Saints, right? We're, we're just going to uh, send some information, some next steps. How do you get connected? Can you find your way? Here, here's how we can make a difference together. And so uh, take a moment to do that. And then you'll notice there's a really big blank area with a pen in the middle because we believe truly spiritual people write down what the pastor says on Sunday. <laughs> Y'all didn't need to laugh that hard right there. Uh, if you're a real tech savvy, one hope church.com has a button that says today's message notes you can actually download the entire message and follow along with me today as i teach god's word we're wrapping up a very quick two-part series that we've simply titled heart for the house and, and next week we're going to be kicking off a short two-week series that we're calling saving the holidays because the the holidays have gotten lost in the hustle and bustle and the holidays have gotten lost in low crazy people would you say that right they got some crazy people out there and so we're going to together we're going to try to save the holidays for our families and for our lives and make sure that we're heading in the right direction i do want to say it's a great time to go to onehopechurch.com and discover our christmas eve services 6 p.m. on Saturday, and then our normal times on Sunday. It's going to be a great weekend where we have special songs and carols, candle lighting. Kids will be in service with us. It's going to be a special time. If you've never been a part of it, I want to invite you to, to, to kind of find your way uh, by going on and reserving seats. It helps us kind of spread some of you out so that all of you don't wake up and decide that you want to come to the 10 a.m. on Sunday, all right? And, and, and we want to make sure that you have a place. And so that's what we're doing this month. Uh, before I, uh, I, I jump into today's message, I just want to, before I sit, say it this way, before I share the second half of our core values that I began last week, I want to establish in truth for you today the importance of the church and why having a heart for the house of God is so important. To do this, I want to take us right to God's word and we'll pray together. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 will be on every screen. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Come on, guys, go ahead and put that up on the screen for me. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, you know, that guy with weird clothing who eats locusts and honey in the wilderness. Some people thought he might be a weird prophet. Some say Elijah. Everybody liked Elijah because even when dead people were thrown into the tomb, they got, came up out of Elijah's grave alive. They liked him. Others say Jeremiah, who was kind of the lamenting prophet. You see that they're kind of giving some comparisons. We think you might be crazy. <laughs> we think you might be powerful, but you might also be the lamenting prophet. We're not really sure if this is going to be good for us. Then he asked them, not to who do they, but who do you say that I am? And you got to love Simon Peter because he's always willing to go first. There's a lot of us who are waiting for somebody else to clear the way before we want to get involved. Simon Peter was willing to like chop a man's ear off. He did some crazy stuff, all right? Simon Peter answered, you are, come on Simon, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What a bold statement. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. This didn't come from studying somewhere. God opened your eyes. You did not learn this from any human being. No, I say to you that you are Peter, changes his name, which means rock. And upon this rock, upon this value, upon this understanding that Jesus is the Messiah, I, come on, read with me, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Some of y'all feel a bit defeated in life. You need to understand who you are. You are the church. 
You are a child of the Most High God. He has placed a blessing on your life. And we have seen the church as an organization, as an organism. It, it, you know, we've seen it as so many other things. Some of us have even seen it as something that's destructive or painful or harmful. Jesus says, no, 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 I need you to understand who you are. You are the church. And the gates of hell cannot conquer you. All around this room, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, today as I take just these few moments to share your word, I pray that you would anoint my words, God, that you would work through me. Help me to get out of the way, God. Help your word to speak to our hearts and our lives, that we would understand what you have called us to do and the difference you've called us to make. God, I pray your blessing upon every person here today. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen together. Amen and amen. Have you ever considered this? Have you ever considered why Jesus makes such a big deal about the church? You ever considered why, why he didn't say, uh, I will build the prophets? Why he didn't say, I will build preachers and sneakers? Come on now. Some of y'all don't know what that is. You can look it up later. He didn't say, I will build buildings. He could have said that, which a lot of people have confused when he said, I will build my church, that I will just build buildings. The word he uses there is a called out people. It's an assembly. It's the people of God. I will build my church. He didn't say all those things. Why did Jesus make such a big deal about establishing you? Why did he make such a big deal about building us together? Why didn't he just say it was one person or one group? No, no, he called us together. We are called out ones. That's what the word church literally means. We are called to something higher, to something bigger, to something better, to make a difference. Why did he do that? Because he needed to elevate for us an authority that was higher than all the other authorities we had seen in the world. He needed us to understand that we would have power to right all the other wrongs in all the other areas, that we would be equipped by God and called by God to invade spaces and make a difference. Now, some of y'all know that I like to kind of take the beginning of a message and try and teach you a little bit something, and then, and then usually I get fired up at the end and start preaching a little bit, but I've already started preaching and some of y'all aren't ready for it, so let me just slow you down. Uh, take some notes with me. There are four authorities that God has established in the world. Four authorities, and our tendency is to kind of get the... the <laughs> We get them out of order. We place some other things in more important arenas. Write it down with me. The first authority that we see in the world is, is civil authorities. Civil authorities, they, they impact commerce and finance. And, and especially in America, we place the, the people who make decisions about money and hiring and firing. We give them way too much value and importance because in America, we've made money. God. Even though we wrote on our money in God. We trust. Why do we do that? Because we needed reminders every time we grab money to remind ourselves that money is not our God. I mean, when you got to write something like that on money, you got to. We can't lose sight of the fact that there's something there that we're trying to tell ourselves. The first authority is a civil authority that we see, and all of us have bosses. Anybody here got a boss? Anybody got a boss? Anybody? Yeah. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you got a boss too. It may be your child. It may be your mother. It may be. <laughs> <laughs> the second authority that we see in the world is a governmental authority and, and governmental authorities they, they impact freedom and they impact justice and law and order and if you have a great government you've got great justice you've got law and order if you have a, a government that's fallen asleep at the wheel you see a lots of injustice you see lots of lawlessness you see disorder in the streets there is civil authority in the world. They have a, they've been given authority by God to produce wealth. They've been given that. Governmental authority, you can find it in Romans chapter 13, those of you who are extra note takers, that God established governmental authorities. And he even says that they don't bear the sword in vain, meaning they have corrective authority. They have the power to actually discipline and bring order to the world. That's one there. The third in which we would say is the first institution that God created, the third authority is the family. This is what you were born into. And if you look at your life, you will see how civil authorities have impacted you, how governmental authorities have, have impacted you. And many of us are dealing with how our families did or did not do well. We're living with the consequences of a, a family environment that's broken down because the first institution that God created wasn't civil, wasn't governmental. The first institution was the family. You want to know why every empire in the world collapses after they destroy the family? Is because the family is the foundation of every empire. 
Now say that again for the people in the back. The first institution that God put in order to create order in the world was your family. And he is God, so he gets to define what a family is. Can I get a good amen from somebody out there? He defines. He defines. And we trust him even though there's lots of confusion in the world today. Those are the first three authorities. And for generations, for thousands of years, most people only saw those three authorities. But when Jesus showed up, he established a fourth authority in the world. He made it clear that there would be a fourth authority that could impact the world. And he called that authority, come on, say with me, the church, right? And the church was brought forth in authority so that it could impact the spiritual and internal and parts of our lives. Let me say it to you this way. God's answer to the civil problems, the governmental problems, and the family problems was to establish a greater authority over those environments. And he called it the church. I always say it like this in crazy family seasons that when God looked at your crazy family, he said, hey, don't worry. You know, I'm grafting you into a, greater, a bigger family that has authority to even write that family. And he said, I'm not just going to use the word family. I'm not going to use your last name. I'm not going to use your generational name. I'm going to give you a term that has been confused, uh, called out once, the ecclesia, the people, a movement of people that are called to fix the other things. These four authorities, you can clearly see how they've impacted your life. You can clearly see why today I'm trying to elevate the church in your eyes. You say, well, you're trying to elevate the organization? I'm not. I'm trying to elevate who you are in authority in this world who we are together, what we can do. Why is the church such a big deal? Write down these three truths. The church is a big deal, number one, because the church has been given authority. I just said it to you, but I want to say it very, very clearly. The church, you have been given authority in civil environments, in governmental environments, in family environments. You say, well, pastor, my family's not saved. My, my area of business, where, where I do business, they're not saved. The, the government area that I work in, they're not Christians. I know that's why you're there. That's why God placed you in the middle. The church isn't supposed to be a spoke on a wheel going round and round. The church is supposed to be the hub of the wheel. We're supposed to be the central part, bringing order and design and making sure that everything goes in order the way God designed it to go. Jesus went on in Matthew 16. If you don't agree, let me just help, it, help you see it in Scripture. He says, I will build my church. And the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So it begs the question, if he says, I've given you that much authority. If you're living with some things that you don't like, I would beg the question, what are you permitting to be in your life? You don't know freedom until you meet Jesus, and then you discover freedom, and then you realize that you actually have the power to say no to all the things you felt like you couldn't say no to before. But it's not until you're actually grafted into the family of God that you begin to realize, I have the power to say no to that addiction. I have the power to say no to that pornography. I have the power to say no to these situations because of the power that God has given me. Are y'all with me today? I know I feel like I got like seven of you convinced. The other, the other y'all kind of like, I don't know, pastor. You know, it sounds good. Now listen, listen, listen. Most often what is still ailing your life is, is the, the, listen, let me say it to you this way. If you're cold today, it's probably because you left your window open last night. And if you're broken in an area, you probably left that window open. And if you're living with certain things that you're like, I don't need, I don't, why is this in my life? Could it be? That you've allowed the enemy to have a foothold in your life. That you allowed other authorities to determine who you are and where you're going. Today, I need you to understand that the church is an authority. But we could get lost in that. And um, last year in our influencer series, I taught you how the church is supposed to be the center of all the spheres of influence. Because the church isn't God's side chick. Y'all know this, right? Can I say it one more time? Come on. The church, write it down this way. The church is the bride of Christ. How important are, are we to God? So important that he, he betrothed his only begotten son to us. 
He made a a deposit on the wedding ceremony and said, I'm preparing a feast for us together where we will join with him. We are are so important to God. 2 Corinthians 11 and 1 says, I hope you will put put up with a little more of my foolishness. That's how I start my messages, by the way. I hope that that you will put up with a little bit more of my foolishness. Please bear with me. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. The Apostle Paul says, I need you to understand that you are the bride of Christ. And for a guy who's been married 20 years, the bride impacts every aspect of your life. So much so we've got sayings like, if mama ain't happy, right? Ain't nobody happy. Unfortunately, the church has been acting like a divorced couple. We're distant, we're divided, we're disloyal. We're counting what the previous pastor leader did and we're holding the next leader accountable for that. We're, we're looking at fallen and broken people and expecting them to be like Jesus. Listen, listen, Jesus is Jesus. Everybody else is falling short. We have to make sure that we don't allow men and women to get on a, spe- a pedestal in our eyes to be like Jesus. I, I am always trying to make sure that you guys don't ha- put, have some sort of God-like complex. God may use me to impact your life, and I'm proud and happy to do those things. But you need to understand that I put my pants on just like you. I got saved just like you. I'm going to heaven just like you. I do not have a special bat phone that when I call God, he listens more. You know, there's not a, a special emblem that goes up in the sky that says, Pastor Josh is coming, look out, you know. It doesn't happen that way. You and I are the same, but some of us know our authority and some of us do not. That's where the difference is. Some of us understand and rightly divide the Word of God, and others of us are just reading it two, three times a year and wondering why we can't live by truth. Listen, you're giving up your authority to all the other environments. Here's the third truth. So the church is an authority. The church is the bride of Christ. Number three, the church mobilized is the hope of the world. The church mobilized is the hope of the world. Not the church sitting on its hands. Not the church living in fear. Not the church withdrawing from the needs in our community. The church mobilized changes the world. That's why we have such a passion to make sure that it's not us four and no more around here, that we're looking to fill the seats around us because it's not about the building, it's about plundering hell and populating heaven. Amen, everybody? That's what it's about. It's about understanding why we are here because once you know God, your greatest calling changes. Once you know him, your responsibility is to make him known in the world. Ephesians chapter 3 and 10 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. God's plan, God's purpose is to elevate you with wisdom, insight, and understanding so that in every civil environment, in every governmental environment, in every family environment, you have the words of Christ. You have truth inside of you, and you're able to display the wisdom of God. Why should you read your Bible? Because the world is in desperate need for you to display the wisdom of God. You know, the U.S. government is so large that leaders are taking stabs in the dark at what we should do to fix or grow or to make it better. They have no idea what to do. They're guessing. They're putting some math on a page, and some of them are bad at math. Y'all can laugh. Come on. Some of y'all remember when you first started. You know what keeps us safe? principle, value, the wisdom of God, because when you don't know what to do, you stay within the the principle of God's word. When you don't know what the outcome will be, you do what's right, and God somehow always makes the math work out. When we forsake principle and value and standard, what happens to us? There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. We need God. We've allowed the church for too long to be seen as an organization. We've distanced ourselves from who we're supposed to be 
and what we're supposed to do. We've been given authority. We are the bride of Christ. We are called to mobilize and display the wisdom of Christ. How do we do this? I established this last week. How do we do this? We, will we stand in the gap? How do we stand in the gap? How do we display? Well, we, we stand in the gap by living out our Christian values. You don't have to do everything. You just have to, every day, do the best you can to live up to the values of God's Word and what it actually says. If you missed last Sunday, I I talked about how we as a church have 12 values that we've established to modernize language. Let me just say it this way. We've modernized the Word of God so that you can understand what the Bible says in language that you can tell your children that they can say, okay, that's what we do. And I scared some of you last week when I said we had 12 of them because you thought I was going to have a 12-point message, okay? And, and I did not. I only had like a 9-point message, all right? And some of, y'all, some of y'all felt better than when I said 12 that I was only going to go to 9. Today, I just want you to know that I've just got 9 again, all right? But I gave you 6 of them last week. And I want to just, if you missed last week, here are the 6 real fast. They're going to put them on screen. We said one of our values is Jesus is first. And everything we do, Jesus is first. The second value, we said we don't want fake people around here. We, want, we believe that authenticity trumps perfection. You do not have to pretend you've got it all worked out. You are, it is okay to not be okay. Amen, everybody? We're just saying it's not okay to stay that way. That we want you to be authentic so that you can get help. The third value of our church is we say life-giving is the only way. Because life-sucking really sucks is what happens, okay? That's what it does. And so we want to make sure that you understand that we're going to take an approach that is joy-filled and hopeful in everything we do. Number four, we honor above all, no matter who you are, no matter your age, your ethnicity, your background, what side the tracks you grew up on. We honor the image of God in every person, and we honor every stage of life. Number five, we, 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 we believe that growing is our only option because we believe that heaven and hell are realities. And so we have to keep doing things that reach people and expand the kingdom of God. Number six, last week we talked about we're all in. We're the kinds of people that when we say, hey, we're skipping this or we're not going to that, we're all in kind of people. Y'all know that, right? We're all in. And can I just say, can I honor some of the eldest in our church that are always earlier than all of y'all? Come on. Miss Ann, wave your hand at me. Come on, Red, wave your hand at me. Wave your hand at me. Miss Ann and I talked about how some of y'all today need to learn how to wake up and come to church on time. <laughs> Miss Ann, you're all in from day one. You walked across the street when we were at Langston Hughes Academy and said, you know what, God's doing something here. And she walked across the street, and then when we moved the Bible away, she drove to church, y'all. Some of y'all, that would be like, oh, I don't know, that's too far. <laughs> These are our values. Can I give you the remaining six in our remaining time? Today, here's my simple goal, heart for the house. You need a heart for the house of God because you're the house of God. And we need to stand in the gap in our culture. That was last week's message. This week, we need to elevate the authority that we have. And instead of walking by the needs, we need to say, no, no, no. I'm planning to change that in Jesus' name. Listen, I I don't have time today to go too far into it. But listen, listen, I have been studying the church since I was a child. I have been in a church plant since I was 9 or 10 years old. I'm 45. I have been nothing but in church my entire life. And I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Come on, somebody wave their hand at me if you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in church, right? I've seen, I've seen some stuff. Y'all remember Dumbo from Walt Disney when he says, I beat unseen about everything when I've seen an elephant fly. I have seen, <laughs> that's funny, I don't care what y'all say, right? I have seen some crazy things, but I still believe and have a heart for the house of God. When God called me into ministry, I literally had this conversation at an altar. I said, God, I want to do what you called me to do, but I don't want it to look like that. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to act like that. I want something different. God, can I do that? And I felt the blessing of God. And he surrounded me with some mentors that helped me to understand that the values we're sharing today can be done. We can live them out. I want to keep on going. Can I give you the seventh one? Here, you got to take some notes. Number seven, we say grit is required. We possess tremendous faith and work hard to accomplish goals. Go ahead and give me the definition. We possess tremendous faith and work hard to accomplish goals. We have soft hearts and tough skin. Some of y'all need to learn this one a little bit. Some of us are like, we got soft skin and we got tough hearts. 
Listen, you can't take everything personal around here. As I said last week, if you can't deal with a little bit of sarcasm, you're really going to struggle. There's been studies. People who enjoy sarcasm actually are smarter than people who cannot enjoy sarcasm. And so you're some of the smartest people I've ever met. You know, life isn't getting easier. We're getting stronger. Amen, everybody? Recent studies tell us of children that the most successful children didn't have it easy. They had to fight through challenges early and thereby developing grit in their lives. James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He says, Consider it pure joy. Like, let's put that in context. Hurricanes. He's like, woohoo. Inflation. Come on, God, we got this. Government overreach. Come on. He's like, he's like, consider it joy. How many of y'all have mastered this? None of us. We need to make sure that we maintain and develop grit because life is not getting easier, and God did not promise that when you became a Christian. He did not say that the world was going to get easier. He promised that you would get stronger and overcome the world. That you would begin to walk in the authority that is necessary to win. Could spend a whole message there, but there are way too many people today that are getting too touchy about too many things. That's my seat. Listen, can I, can I just dispel that, that whole, that's my seat? And listen, uh, we put some stanchions up today just to mess with y'all so that I could say it. Right? That, that, that's not your seat. That's, ain't nobody got time for that kind of stuff, right? We're going to major in the majors and minor in the minors. Can I get a resounding amen? amen? Number eight, we say excellence matters. Excellence matters. We leave everything better than we find it. We want our good enough to get better until we become our best. Colossians 4 and 17 says, Do your best in the job you receive from the master. Do your very best. We aren't perfect around here, and that isn't even a goal for us, but we can get better. We can make things better. As I mentioned to you a little over nine years ago when we began One Hope Church, in the DeSay neighborhood over there at Langston Hughes Academy, about a mile from here, uh, the teachers and the directors of the school said, listen, you need to go to the DeSay Neighborhood Association meeting because they, they really are particular about how people park on the streets. No church that we've had so far in the history of One Hope Church has had enough parking for the church. We're in Louisiana we're in New Orleans, and the way churches survived in previous generations was to sell all their property off, and that's part of the reason why there's no parking. But, but we are better than that. Amen, everybody? We, we can park on the street, can't we? We can find our way. But they said, you need to go meet with them because we don't want them calling the police for you parking in front of their house. And so I went to the meeting, and, and, and there, was, there was a good bit of talking going on. Can I say that? That's a polite way of putting it. And so it came my opportunity to speak, and I said, I just want you to know that we are One Hope. We're going to be starting a church here at Langston Hughes Academy. I want, want you to know that we're going to be in the area doing some things, and we would love if something comes up that you would just let us know personally how we could serve you. Instead of even getting involved in the parking and all that kind of stuff, you know what we did the next week? We had a serve Saturday, and we walked down the block, and we cut everybody's grass that needed to be cut, and we wore our serve shirts. And on launch day, when we had more donuts than we knew what to do with, we walked down the street with dozens of donuts and said, hey, we, we, we had our grand opening today. We had some extra donuts. God bless you. And, and we, you know what we did? We didn't do that one month. We did that two months and three months. And now we're nine years in of almost every single month we serve our city and we make a difference. You know what? We never had a single complaint about parking. We never had a single issue. Why? Because excellence matters. And instead of asking about somebody for something, we just showed up with our excellence. And we made the street better, right? I know when we moved in here, there were some neighbors like really excited. Some others were like, oh, we're going to, you know, is this going to be loud? Is it going to be too many people? Listen, can I just tell you, we're going to kill them with kindness and excellence. We're going to take care of them and we're going to make sure that when a need arises, we're going to be the church. I would say too that one of the reasons why we're kind of dancing on 
whether we should add a third service and why we ask some of you guys to move up a little bit in seating today is because what we find is that, that uh, unbelievers and people who are far from God, they're not usually early to church. Y'all know that? And so we want to make room for them to come in and rather than forcing them all to come to the front because some of y'all don't like to sit near me, I don't know why. <laughs> so we're making an effort in excellence to push them forward so that our ushers can take care of them better. Please know that that's not personal. That's just being the best we can be to make sure that when people come in, they get the best foot forward and there's a place for them that doesn't feel embarrassing. You know, walking in late and, and somebody walk you out all the way to the front kind of feels a little bit like, what are they doing with me? We want them to enjoy the process. Can y'all go with me? Number nine. Number nine, we say we're passionate. We express devotion that reflects the heart of Christ and love people passionately. We are better together. I don't know how to say it any differently, but I, I have been in, in environments where there just wasn't a lot of passion and actually, every research environment in, that has kind of looked at the church, Barna Research is very respected, said that if your church is growing, it largely has to do with the passion of the pastor and the leadership. That when you go to a church where the pastor isn't passionate and pushing and going forward and trying some things, that that church is never growing. And so today, I just need you to know that what you see is what you get. I'm going forward. We are going to win. We're going to stand before God and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because Psalm 69.9 says, Passion for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult you has fallen on me. Today, I, I sat with an individual that's been harmed by another spiritual leader. And you know what I said to them? I said to them, can I stand proxy for them? I'm not them. But can I stand in and say, I'm so sorry that that happened. That won't happen here. We'll take responsibility. Why? Because I am passionate that even the insults I sense and hold and say, no, no, no. It's our responsibility to do this differently. Someone said to me, you know, I would come to your church if y'all weren't so loud and amped up all the time. But they go to Saints games with face paint on. And I said, hey, I understand there are plenty of quiet places to go on Sundays. Can I help you find one? Just kidding. I didn't say that out loud. I thought it, though. And I just needed to confess to y'all. That wasn't a good thought. I just needed to confess that sometimes I don't think the right thing. I don't know. I just, I was like, do you want, do you want a pastor who's passionate about following Jesus? Or do you want Dr. Phil? I don't even think I could do his voice. He'd be like, go get him. It's just not who I am. Number 10. Focus keeps us. Focus keeps us. We are spirit-led and talk more about where we are going than where we've been. Living a great commission life is our vision. Living a life focused on what God has called us to do, that's our vision. Philippians 3.13, uh, the Apostle Paul said, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. When I was really young, my dad used to say it this way. He'd say, he said, you know, Joshua, he, he suffers from a disease called focus. My entire life, I don't know, I, I feel like it's been a gift. Some people don't see it as a gift. But when I see something that I believe God has called us to do, I cannot let go of it. I pursue passionately and go after it. Number 11, our value is simply this. We believe that everyone leads. So we collaborate, communicate, and make room for others to lead. We value cre creativity and we give our gift to influence the world. You may have never considered yourself a leader, but you're influencing the people around you no matter what you think. Leadership is influence, and I'm just asking you to recognize that as a spiritual authority, as the church, you have more influence than you think. By simply living out these values, you can impact the people around you. Romans chapter 12 
says, if your gift is serving, serve them well. And if you're a teacher, then teach them well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. A couple of years back when our kids were just a bit younger, and they're still pretty energetic, but there was a moment where Amber was just, my wife Amber was just dealing with our children and, and how they just wanted to go everywhere and do everything. And some of you have young children, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like they've got the energy of 17 people. And she sent me this quote one day because I used to tell them, I used to say, listen, I don't know if our children will be pastors, like if, whether they will lead a church, but they will be ministers and leaders in the world no matter what. And I've said to our children, I said, listen, you're a leader no matter where you go. You need to remember you're a leader. People are looking for someone to lead the way. And Amber sent me this quote one day. She said, she said this, is, this is my prayer for our children and specifically our son at the time. She said, Lord, he's either going to change the world or he's going to be the leader of a prison gang. God, let him change the world. Here's our last and we close. These three words. We believe that hope changes everything. And today, if you've experienced something different in the church and in your life, today you feel a bit of hopelessness. I need you to understand that even in times of doubt, we infuse hope. We carry hope. We live hopeful lives. We are one hope. Why? Because the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. Ephesians 4, 4 says it this way, there is one body and one spirit and God has called you to have one hope. It's the only place in the Bible you find those two words connected. It's where we derive our name. And today, if you walked in and you felt the difference in this place, if you felt the difference and said there's something different happening here, I want you to know what you stumbled into is a group of people who are going to stand in the gap, a group of people that are elevating the church and our authority, and we refuse to be a spoke on the wheel any longer. We're doing everything we can to be the hub of the wheel of our society, to dive in and to make a difference in the care and to serve. And today I need you to know what you're feeling is a group of people who said we're going to live out these values. We're going to live out these values. So it's time, it's time to make sure that as we prepare for Christmas that you invite, you care. There's a Christmas service where someone needs to come with you. You need to grab a fistful of the invitations and you need to say, I'm, bring, I'm inviting you in, come be a part of this, just come see it one time. I believe if you do, lives will be changed. As we go, can I share with you one quick story and we'll pray. This week, Pastor Danny shared this story to our staff, and I thought, wow, what a beautiful way to wrap up this series. The story goes this way. It says, about 26 years ago, a pastor was standing in line at a convenience store in New Orleans and noticed the family in front of them did not have enough money to pay for the few items they were buying. The pastor tapped the man on the shoulder and told him not to turn around, but to please take the money he was offering him. The man took the money and never turned around to look at the kind stranger helping him. Nine years had passed, and the pastor was invited as a guest speaker in New Orleans. He spoke, and after the service, he was standing by the door greeting people. And after most everyone had left, the gentleman walked up to him, and he told the pastor an amazing story about how he had come to know the Lord. Several years ago, he and his wife and their child were destitute. They had lost everything, had no jobs, no money and were living in their car. They were not Christians at the time and decided to make a suicide pact and discuss what they would do. They decided that they would at least give their child some food before they killed themselves and drove away to buy milk and food. And they were standing in line at the store and realized they did not have enough money to pay for the few items. And he said a man behind him spoke and asked him to please take the money from his hand and not to look at him. And the man also told him and his family that Jesus loves you. The man said that they left the store, drove back to the place that he planned to commit suicide and wept for hours. They knew that they could not go through with what they had planned to do, so they drove away. They drove by a church with a sign that said, Jesus loves you. 
and went to the church the next Sunday. The man and the woman both got saved that day in church. The man then told the pastor that the minute he stood up in the pulpit and started speaking, that he knew immediately that the pastor was the kind stranger from nine years ago. He said he would never forget that South African accent. He continued on to tell the pastor that because of his one random act of kindness, he saved three lives that day. And because he had told them that Jesus loves them, it, draw, it had drawn them into the church where they accepted Christ. Church, we need a heart for the house of God. We need to stand in the gap and we need to elevate our authority in this city. And we express our heart for the house, not just by giving to an offering, but by living out these values every day living them out to the best of our ability. Would you bow with me in prayer? If you're here today and during this time of worship or studying God's word, you've experienced something new. Maybe you discovered that you're far from God today. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand. I, I will not ask you to come to the front. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you're far from God, the Bible says you're one prayer away from changing everything. Would you whisper this prayer right after me? Say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.